Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roders. Hey. Woo. Today we have a very special guest who we actually met when we went to the Pursuit Conference in Houston, Texas, and he is also a co-host with Joshua Lewis, who came to our church um, and spoke on the gifts. He is the co-host with Remnant Radio, and he also is the pastor of a church called Reclamation Church in Denver, and he also is the president of Thomas Ministries, but you can check out the website in the description below. But we are excited to talk about tearing down strongholds of the mind. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Michael Miller. Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. Well, it's awesome. We met you in um, Woodlands, Texas, right? And that was really cool because we went to your breakout session. And the first one was on healing, deliverance, and starting uh, a church healing ministry. And then your second one was talking about tearing down strongholds of the mind. So we'll be talking about that today. But we were blessed by both of those. So mm. it's cool to have you on yeah. our podcast today. Yeah. But, Dad, would you like to pray for us before we get started? Father, well, I just thank you for Michael. Thank you for his ministry and how it just was so powerful to me and my family. Mm -hmm. I just ask that you would just speak through him today like you did before and uh, just really help us. As, as Michael knows very well, there's so many people with so many, as he said, he knew the truth in his head, but yet he didn't really believe it deep in his heart of hearts. And so, God, help us not to just be hearers of your word, but be effectual doers and to apply it and really believe it. And uh, like Michael, I loved his honesty of how he wrestled through a lot of these things and was almost mad at you at times and but yet you just shine would shine light on those dark areas or those lies he believed and i pray you'll do that with all of us lord as we all if we're humble we all have areas where we know the truth but we don't deep down believe it and i just ask that you would just really set captives free and really renew our minds through the washing of your word we love you and we commit this time to you in jesus mighty name amen amen all right so for those who don't know you could you just share maybe like a quick bio i shared a little bit in the intro but yeah, just sure. for those who don't know you yeah so um i've been in uh became a believer i was 15 somebody gave me a bible i was kind of completely green i'd never read anything mm -hmm. and so i i thought it was a book of ancient spells <laughs> <laughs> like, like something on witchcraft or something and i didn't know any different and uh i would read about jesus and kind of fell in love with what i read and uh, who he was and just knew I wanted to be like him. And so I started going to church with some buddies of mine. I would lie to my mom so I could and stay the night at my friend's house on Saturday night because I knew that friend went to church on Sunday morning. Mm. And then uh, eventually got discipled up in, in Young Life and went off to college um, and then uh, got my hands on Jack Deere's book, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, and then ended up being mentored by him for about six years. We travel with him doing conference and then I've planted uh, around four churches now, and I'm now settled in the Denver area um, with my church called Reclamation Church in Denver. And then I also have a little side gig ministry called Thomas Ministries, and it's sort of – it's what I used to – it's well, it's, it's an avenue with which I met you guys, um, doing you know equipping and training and the gifts and that kind of thing, and then also – have that podcast. I've got a lot of stuff going on. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I've got the podcast. I'm a co-host on the, the Remnant Radio. So I kind of sum it up for you. Yeah, yeah that was perfect. Yeah. And it's just, it was really cool because when we went to the conference um, in Houston, we were already like dealing with some things and just stuff with my mom because she has stage four metastas metastasized breast cancer and all that. And then we've also been um, trying to start a healing ministry. And so my dad, when we were on the way oh, man. to the conference, it was really cool because we, my dad was reading Power Healing by John Wimber. Oh. And then we went to your breakout session, not knowing um, that you would talk about that. And that was like, you quoted that. And so it was just really powerful. And it really ministered to our family because we were like kind of going through a lot. And it was really emotional during that time. And it like of still course. is. But yeah, it was really cool how like the first session you had talked about was healing, deliverance and starting a church healing ministry. And that's like the very thing we are yeah. doing and going through that book with like a group of people. So that was, and it's really cool. cool, as you know, probably better than me, but it came out of Calvary. I mean, yeah. Wimber was a part of Calvary sure. and Calvary kind of got, we always say Calvary's kind of Baptocostal now, right? More Baptist mm -hmm. than to believe the gifts, but where I'm trying to be old school Calvary kind of go back, you know, cause that's why Wimber kind of broke away as you know, 
And so uh, we're trying yeah. to, so it was really cool to, cause I'd read that before I knew about the conference. I was reading that again because I was so touched by John. I got to meet John. I didn't know John like you, Jack Deere and all those guys did, but it was really cool. And cause that's kind of the foundation of Calvary, but Calvary sort of, in my humble opinion, gotten away from that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like there's a, a resurgence amongst, amongst Calvary pastors yeah. to get back to the roots of uh, when Calvary started. Yeah. Uh, which I've always loved that. Uh, I, I guess it's the denomination, correct? Well, they say it, right. but they, everyone jokes it's the largest non-denominational denomination. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, like, right. Yeah. Well, it it, uh, it definitely started off with gifts of the Spirit, but I've always admired it from afar. I love expository preaching, and I value those kind of things. So it seems like there's a uh, a lot of a common affinity. Mm-hmm. So very much appreciate that. And I'm excited for you guys. I, I, I feel bad because you came out to that conference and that session I did on uh, starting a healing ministry was really not <laughs> about starting a healing ministry. <laughs> we just didn't. I had too much content and I couldn't get through it in the time that we had. So yeah, that was still good. it was still really good. And then so I took I had a lot of notes from the conference, but um, maybe just I remember the first thing that you explained to everyone was um demonization and just explaining that because now Hollywood has made it where it's like possession and talking about that. So can you explain to people? Oh, let me, let me jump in with that. I also, if you could really, uh, Michael is because Calvary's, you know, there's a big, I don't know if you know anything about Calvary's, but there's Mm -hmm. some pastors, probably the majority. I'm, I'm bad. You guys probably know more, but a lot of Calvary pastors, Chuck being one of them did not believe you could be demonized as a Christian that you could not have a demon pose- oppression, you couldn't be oppressed. And he used the scripture of, uh, you know, First John f- uh, five eighteen, you know, and I'm shredding it, but basically, you know, those who are the New Living says those who are Christians do not make a practice of sinning, and the enemy cannot touch them or injure or harm them. What does it say? Touch them. So he would say, see, if you're a Christian, the enemy can't touch you. But let's preface the first part. I don't know if you agree with it. But those who don't make a practice of sinning, well, how many Christians make a practice of pornography, fornication, you know what I mean? Which gives, as one guy, I don't know if it was Derek Prince or whatever, he's a little trippy, but he said, get rid of the garbage and the rats will flee. But can you kind of, because you explained how even the word possession isn't really a biblical term, Mm -hmm. but if you can kind of explain how you could explain to a Calvary guy or people that don't believe you can even be oppressed as a Christian, how that works with the whole demonization thing. Gosh, okay, that's a, that's a longer <laughs> Sorry, <bro. laughs> uh, question. Your kids will be up by then. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's fine. I'll, I'll try to I try to go through, build as much of an argument as I can for the idea that Christians actually can be demonized, but then also dealing with the the word itself being misperceived by and large. Mm-hmm. So the word you read in your English translation for possession uh, is just literally the word demon that's been changed from a noun to a verb. Mm-hmm. So even in English, we do this. So anytime you want to take a, a noun that doesn't have his own verb form, like let's say theology, uh, you add the, the letters I-Z-E. So uh, we would say, hey, don't theologize me, right? Yeah. Well, in the scriptures, they do the exact same thing. In Greek, they do the exact same thing. They take you know the, the, the noun, and then they add a little... Uh, ending to it to turn it into a verb. Mm. And so the word is just literally demon eyes. That's all it is. Uh, And the thing about demonize is it doesn't necessarily describe to what degree a person is demonized. Mm. Um, I mean, one could argue that Jesus was being demonized when he was being tempted in the garden, right? Who was tempting him? Well, it was Satan. So on some level, Satan was exerting a level of influence over Jesus. Granted, Jesus, you know, says that the devil has nothing in me, so he's able to avert that temptation. Um, but the, and I know that that's going to fly in the face of some people, the idea that I just said Jesus. But we all agree that it was the devil tempting him and that Jesus really was tempted, but without sin. Amen. He didn't fall into it. But then you've got a number of letters, you know, all of the epistles where you, where you see several little warnings to Christians, um, like Ephesians, where he says, hey, be angry, mm-hmm. yet do not sin. And then he says, do not let the sun go down in your anger. And, and the reason why is because, you know, anger in and of itself, normal human emotion, undealt with anger can lead us into sin. Yeah. And then what's worse than that is if you let the sun go down on your anger, he says, do not give the devil a foothold. Mm. Well, Which I don't know how can me, that not be oppression, right? <laughs> I mean, well, 
what do you call it? Oppression. I mean, the, the word oppression isn't in, isn't in the scripture. The word possession that sort of means completely owned, mm. and uh, you know that 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 is also not in the scripture. The word simply is demonize, mm. and so and that covers a whole spectrum. That covers possession, oppression, temptation. Uh, it covers a number of different things. Um, but for the devil to get a foothold in the life in the life of an Ephesian believer, that he's not saying he's not warning them of something that couldn't happen. He's mm-hmm. warning them of something that could happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when we think of foothold, that's what we talk about, like when we're conducting war, like during D-Day, the American troops, when they stormed the beaches of Normandy, they were trying to get a foothold in Western Europe. Mm-hmm. It was a place from which they could conduct further warfare. So do you want to give the enemy a place in your life where he could conduct further warfare? And, and what do we know of people when they're bitter and angry? Well, usually their perception of others that they're bitter with tends to get uh, demonically influenced. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, but but it could also uh, show up in a number of different ways. That's just one example out of Ephesians. There's a number of different examples you can find in the other epistles of similar things. Uh, but different problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, James, I think, is probably the most visceral one out of James 3, uh, where he talks about different kinds of wisdom. Mm. And he mentioned selfish ambition, mm-hmm. jealousy, mm-hmm. bitter rivalry. And he calls them uh, uh, demonic wisdom, yeah. mm-hmm. wisdom that comes from below. It's earthly, natural, demonic. And, and he's writing again to Christians. He doesn't want them to operate in that kind of wisdom, yeah. which means that they could. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. Did that sum it up for you? No, I tried to go perfect. real fast on that. <laughs> that was good. And it's good, too, because there's a lot of people right now dealing with a lot of rejection, like sexual abuse. And you had, like, mentioned self-worth, like, oh, I'm just damaged good. And I think when certain things start happening or, like, I've seen, especially this with, with women, if they've been molested or something happened to them, they start, like, everything in their their life, it's, like, constantly they just have um these feelings of being like a victim which i mean obviously you were and that was like you were hurt but they don't really move past that so i think with what you're saying too i i think what like our main thing what we're trying to see in the church is saying like what to do like what do we do in those situations because i feel like there's so many people who are just trapped Mm -hmm. and they're just like there's nothing i can do i'm always going to be like this i'm always going to have these thoughts or feel this way so like maybe well, yeah. I really liked I was really touched Michael when you said when you're really candid about how your father mm. you know kind of the abandonment and how you believed yeah. the lie that you weren't kind of I'm not you helped me out but you weren't worthy of love sure and how you believe that and then you kind of project that to women that they always had to call you or text you if, I guess I'm old school right calling don't even know what that is but you know what I mean they yeah. had to communicate with you and if they didn't yeah. you put all these things over they don't love me they don't like me oh my goodness you'd blow it up and you know, and I, I related to that because I was told by a psychologist, a Christian guy, that because I didn't get love as a kid, mm. I always went for the girl that didn't love me yeah. because I didn't deserve love. And then when a girl like you said, or like that, that's where I connect with you, where a girl who liked me, I'm like, what is wrong with you? You like <laughs> me. This is something really wrong. Yeah. But it's like, so I always went for the, I mean, two of the girls I dated turned out to be lesbians, you know, in Christ. And so, I mean, I'm thinking, man, that was a messed up puppy. But it's like, you know, if you could kind of unpack that mm-hmm. for just, yeah, I really yeah. liked how you saw, how you really, spe- I mean, even though I knew what you said, but just the way you said it where yeah. I'd never heard it that clear, where just you knew the truth, yeah. but then reality was you believed the lie and that gave the devil a stronghold. And that was just so, just so clear. And so if you could kind of, before your kids wake up, unpack <laughs> How that? How yeah, you saw? Yeah, yeah. How God got to reveal that so, to you? So you, the the scripture. Well, we we talked about several different things at that conference, and I think what you guys are referring to is uh, how I dealt with some of the childhood trauma that played out into my adult dysfunction. Um, so I had several things happen to me as a young man. Uh, one, dad took dad, mom got divorced when I was a year old. Dad married another another woman at age four who had six kids and didn't pay child support. Mm. Um. So what, what that did was, I mean, I mean, when you think about it, what does that say about a young kid whose dad uh, abandons him and, and raises somebody else's kids? Mm. Well, in reality, it says nothing. But a four-year-old can't comprehend that. A four-year-old doesn't know how to uh, interpret that in a healthy way. So a four-year-old will hear a message from the, lo- from the enemy saying, hey, you're not worth knowing. Mm. You're not worth sticking around for. There's another family over that that's more worth knowing. Mm. Now, as a four-year-old, that 
little bit of a lie uh, and that wounding and that rejection, it can play out in, in massive ways over the long haul. And this is what I think the enemy really wants us to do. He wants to live long term in our lives. He wants to get a foothold, a place from which he can dwell uh, for the long haul. Yeah. And the way that he entraps a human being is getting it, getting so intertwined in their personality that they don't know the difference between them and the enemy. Mm-hmm. And so here I was as a four-year-old, uh, and I believed this lie. And then the enemy just starts to wreak havoc, reinforcing that lie over 30 years. Um, So you think about this, somebody who's lived with a particular way of thinking for such a long period of time, uh, that's not just a simple lie that we believe. That's called a stronghold. It's what uh, 2 Corinthians 10 says. It says, for though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons for our warfare are not human weapons, but are made up, are made powerful by God for the tearing down of strongholds. And then he what a stronghold is. He says, we tear down arguments, every arrogant obstacle that is raised up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to make it obey Christ. So when you say, when you talk about a stronghold, if it's knowledge that's raised up against the knowledge of God, and he calls it lofty, right? Because it, in some sense, it's, it's arrogant to say that you know better than God does. So if you imagine over here, here's the lie of the it's been reinforced over years and years and years to where now it's it's not just a like a small little thing that I could bat away, but it's a stronghold. It's a force to be reckoned with. And it's it's actually an argument, and it's raised up against the knowledge of God over here. And the worst part about a stronghold is strongholds feel true. The lies we believe about ourselves feel true. Yeah. So in my case, I felt... I wasn't worth knowing. I felt I wasn't worth loving. I felt like I wasn't worth sticking around with, sticking around for. Um, now, now, albeit I didn't know it on a conscience level, a conscious level, right? This is all subconscious. I would never say those things. Like in my head, I God loved me. Mm-hmm. In my head, I that I was a child of God mm-hmm. and that I was made in His image and that there was worth that I had because Jesus died. But that was just factual knowledge. It didn't pierce the heart and transform it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And. So, You've got this thing that I really believe that's sort of behind the surface, but it's incredibly strong and palpable, and it feels true. Yeah, I, Where I, I, here it act lodged away yeah. and doesn't feel true. What I liked, what you said, like I knew how I knew I had oppression. I was a Baptist, saved Baptist, so I didn't believe in this stuff, right? We didn't believe, you know, only Ozzy Osbourne might have a demon back in my day when I got saved forty days, forty years ago. But it's like. I would hear, so whenever I would get angry, like something bad would happen, like car break down in the middle of nowhere, I would like start getting angry at God, like yeah. why? And I would go, why? I know God loves me, but now I'm blaming God for my car break. You know what I mean? And I could see this deep-rooted lie that I was always a daylight. I want to ask you, did you ever hear any, when you were a kid, you said it was subconscious, but I remember as a little kid going through my pain where my I, my mom died when I was young, when I was six, my dad was never there. So my aunt had to take me, and I remember hearing voices, and I just thought it was my subconscious, but I'd hear voices like, hate your aunt, hate your aunt. And I remember going, no, you know, as a little kid, no. And then it just slowly, like you said, after then I'm about 18 years old, then I started, my aunt was kind of hard on me, but it was like, did you ever, were you ever conscious of kind of like a outward force trying to re- reinforce that lie, or it was just something you believe life said to you? Uh, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was ever conscious of it until I was, <laughs> you know, like you, you live with it for so but, long. I mean, looking back, did you kind of see it? You see what I'm saying? It's when I got delivered, I went, oh my goodness, I've been hearing not just the lies of life, like, you know, you know, but I would hear like kind of a subconscious voice telling me this is, let me interpret this, what happened here. You know, God doesn't care. I mean, Looking back, I can absolutely see a number of demonic thoughts that I had throughout my life. Mm. Thoughts of suicide, yeah. thoughts of hopelessness, thoughts of loneliness. I mean, I would, I would, you know, it wasn't just the, the abandonment that I suffered. It was also the fact that I had been molested as, mm. a, as a young boy. Mm. And, and all of those things send messages to a young boy. I mean, it fills you with shame. Yeah. And so I would find myself with a group of people, you know, all people who loved me, but I would feel utterly alone. Mm. Mm. And that sort of culminated. I remember being on a, a retreat with Young Life when I was a Young Life leader and uh, locking myself in a bathroom and crying and not really knowing why. Mm. And that was sort of the beginning of, of the, the process of getting some of the stuff exposed and bringing it into the light and 
um, so that I could I could actually start to experience the transformational work of Christ. So it, yeah, I, I, yes, looking back on it, I can see those things, mm-hmm. but at the time, I definitely mm-hmm. could not. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't until it wasn't until I was probably in my thirties when I when I could see a real tangible difference between that demonic thought and my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, said, and you said, or like how you said, it used to be a tsunami, like this girl hates me. And then, you know, and then it, mm. beca- as you had spoke truth to that lie or let the she word, the truth would undo the lie. Then you said it became smaller and smaller. And yeah. Smaller. Yeah. Well, and I would say that it wasn't, it wasn't so much, again, most of the stuff on a conscious level was not there. Like, I didn't think this girl hates me. I thought, oh no, she doesn't want to be with me anymore. Mm. And it was because she hadn't texted me back and it was because it had only been five minutes, <laughs> but you know, that was long enough for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so my, my pattern was to then smother the person until they can no longer stand being with me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, it was always the one that was walking away anyways, because that's, that's it. Just what you did, right? Like I'm still trying to chase after my father mm-hmm. who left. Mm-hmm. So you had that so same girl, you relate to me of the sense of, I don't deserve love. So I kind of go for people that are going to kind of give me what I think I deserve subconsciously. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that, that's the nature of it. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, and it's sin. Acting out of fear like that, mm-hmm. fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, it is sin. But I really, I really like what you said too. You know, I thought it was really cool. You said, I love my wife. I feel secure with my wife, but I don't need my wife. I don't have to have my wife right. to be happy. And that was pretty, I thought, wow, that's a really healthy statement. You know what I mean? And most mm-hmm. people, <laughs> wife like, what? You know, but it's pretty cool to be able to say, you know what I mean? I, I'm glad for you. I'm thankful for you. I'm so blessed, but I don't have to have you. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like God's enough well, that's... and you're a blessing. You're an added blessing to Marty Bless Life. Amen. Right. The the relationships we need in life, like we need our parents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We do. We, we, actually, we actually need our parents yeah. uh, until we're adults and then we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the the way that a spouse should operate or a friend should operate, I mean, both of these types of relationships are choices that we make. And when we're healthy, we have the freedom to enjoy those relationships. Mm. Like somebody who, who feels obligated to spend time with me or somebody who I feel obligated to spend time with, I, I don't really want to spend time with that person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So any kind, of, any kind of need that has drawn me in, uh, we tend to reject those kind of people unless it's our kids. Mm. Uh, when our kids need us, even though we don't feel like it, we know that's our responsibility. They're our kids mm. and we love to do it. But with a spouse, um, needing them to feel good about myself is a need they're not supposed to fill. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a need that only God can fill. And I'm asking them to play God in my life. And that's unhealthy for them. And eventually it's going to wear them out. Someone, I heard a psychologist once say, it's like we have a, like a lot of people walk around with an umbilical cord trying to suck life yeah. out of someone else and they just go, right. I can't take it. Yeah, anymore. yeah. You're, 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 you're a vampire, suck, yeah, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Emotional vampire. Yeah. A worse vampire. Yeah. 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 And I think uh, a lot of, I saw a lot of people coming up um, and asking you too about like relationship and stuff when you brought it up because that's like a big thing people are dealing with, especially those who are single. Like we have a young adults group and I love that our young adults group, a lot of them are single, but it's not like a singles group because that's like a big thing in church. Like, let's just go to church to like find a spouse. No. But can you... But don't call it singles. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, singles ministry. But I think that it's really cool to when you're going all out for the Lord, not hearing the lies of the enemy and not overthinking things. Because I think that's the issue with what I see and just like for you um, to just give advice for maybe young people who are out there who are just overthinking and they're overthinking other people like, well, I just don't feel like, or you're making all these assumptions that this person's going to do something they didn't instead of communicating. And can you just explain, because I know people, there's they, like the new term is like, it's not new, but everyone says red flags, you know, or like, oh, we're oh, right. just, hmm. I saw red flag, but it's not based <laughs> off the Bible or it's not, we're looking at scripture and saying, well, it's a red flag because the Bible says it's just, we've made it up like our own red flags or just feeling like, well, I just don't feel like we'd be compatible. But can you explain to young people like what we should be doing and like things with like, um, I guess. And we're just say that too. I don't know if we're asking too compound a question, but you also said something. I think if I heard you right, correct me and slap me if I'm wrong. But you said I probably could have married some of these other girls yeah. if I was healthy. Yeah. Didn't you say something like that? Yeah. Well, that's true. There was a number of girls I probably could have married. Uh, both the ones who who. 
who liked me and the yeah. ones who I chased off. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all of them were compatible mates. And, and I think I, I would have quite enjoyed a, a marriage there. I, I'm thankful for my wife yeah, today. Yeah, you don't want your wife to so like, what'd you say? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, but, uh, but that's true. I think, I think, you know, but I, I have a hard time with the idea of the one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just yeah. think there is so many good people on the earth that yeah. God has made, and he's made us all compatible with far more than we realize. Um, and how and, could Solomon have so, 700 wives? If he was? Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was probably unhealthy. No, no. <laughs> might be a little unhealthy. No. I mean, he certainly uh, provided, I would hope. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. you know, look at that time. He definitely didn't need yeah. them. <laughs> right? no, okay. Yeah. No, just so kidding. we say... Yeah. We said red flag. You know, there are definitely like relationships that I would look at and go, you know, this person's got some work to do before that I would I would encourage them to be in a marriage, Mm -hmm. right? That the but especially if if they need that person for happiness, Mm. that's that's a you can call it a red flag if you want to, but that's not the kind of red flag most people point out. You know, uh, the the a lot of the I mean, as a single guy, I, I had just some foolish ideas about uh, what I thought I needed in a spouse. Hmm. And the truth is like things I think are probably, I, I would look at it different than uh, today and, and do it. Yes. Or less of a right and wrong and more of a wise versus unwise yeah. category. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would say wisdom uh, today, uh, if I was to, to do that whole thing over again and God willing that, that won't happen mm-hmm. uh, for me anyway, um, but I would I would look for those who are wise with their finances, mm-hmm. those who love the Lord, mm-hmm. um, those that understand that faithfulness is a choice and that love is a choice mm-hmm. and not a natural affection or feeling or motivator. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I mean, because here's the truth. I show my wife affection and love regardless of whether I feel like yeah. doing it or not. Amen. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, somebody gave me some great advice one time, and I, I to this day I, I employ it. Um, my marriage is one hundred percent me, zero percent my wife. Mm, mm. That's good. That's good. Meaning she doesn't have to give me anything yeah. for me to give my one hundred percent all. Yeah. And if you if my wife were here, she would say uh, my marriage is one hundred percent me, zero percent my husband. Mm, mm. That's good. It's because we're not we're not making decisions on how we treat one another based on how we're being treated. Mm. Um, it's, it's because of the covenant. It's because of the choice I made to be faithful to a person. Mm. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. I know. Cause I remember, um, I think it was Matt Chandler. He was talking about his wife, Lauren, and he was saying, yeah, all the things that I thought that I was like, I really loved about her. Cause we had the same similar things. Like we love concerts then come to find when we're in ministry, we don't have time for those things. But so there's like some stupid things oh, that yeah. us as young people, like we put like, oh, especially girls when they're told like, write down the list of that guy. But it's like, like you said, there are some simple like things like, are they responsible? Like, are they faithful? Um, are they really, do they really submit to the Lord? Are they being discipled? Are they a man of humility? Like there's a lot of, other things that we should be looking at yeah. than like their, the color of their hair or do they have this job or that job, which right. it's just, yeah, it's yeah. messed up. But um, I like when you're talking about the strongholds of the mind. So someone out there saying, well, I have been molested or, you know, I do feel rejected. Okay. I just keep hearing, go to church and read the Bible, but I just still, I feel like it's not working. Like, what do I do? What would you, well, what would you say to that yeah. person? Yeah, that idea, if you'll just read your Bible more, if you'll just mm-hmm. pray more. I mean, I, I don't know what the more is enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you were to ask any person in any church, how many of you read your Bible enough? How many of you pray enough? Mm-hmm. The person who's got their hand raised is probably off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever standard they think is enough it is, is not. Mm-hmm. There is no standard for what is enough. Um, and, and the fact is you can, uh, search the scriptures and you can memorize the scriptures all day long, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee a transformed mind mm-hmm. and a renewed heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Pharisees, they knew the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, Jesus said, but yet you will not come to me that you may have life. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's this sense in which they, they knew the scriptures, they searched the scriptures, but they still weren't able, they weren't transformed by them and yeah. they didn't receive Jesus. Um, 
So one of the, the obstacles that I used to get, and this used to frustrate me when I was in the midst of sabotaging another relationship, somebody would say something like, uh, well, hey, you know, the truth will set you free. <laughs> and I just wanted to look at them and, and slap them across the face and say, you know, the truth will set you free. <laughs> uh, but the the problem is, is that everybody always leaves out the first part of that verse it says, then you will know the truth mm. and the truth will set you free. Mm-hmm. And that, that word to know the mm-hmm. truth, that's a Semitic term, right? That's a yeah. that's a, a phrase meant to, to um, be more inviting of an experience rather than a, a fact lodged away in your head. Mm-hmm. Right. So Adam, he knew Eve, meaning they were intimate. Mm -hmm. And so it's an intimate exchange with that knowledge, uh, a a feeling the affections of Christ, not just knowing that Mm -hmm. he loves us, that he cares about us. And even further, right? I mean, that's gnosis, like a man knows his wife. I mean, it's that's one of the definitions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, So. Uh, for me, I didn't just need to have the the scripture memorized, uh, you know, God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you, Mm. Uh, that you're worth loving because, well, the son of God uh, gave his life for you. He shed his blood for you, Mm. which, by the way, when we talk about arrogant thought, I mean, think about how arrogant this is. I'm not worth loving. Mm. And yet the father sacrificed the blood of his son (laughs) to tell me what my worth is. So, so what, what kind of, what does that say to God? Mm. Hey, yeah, your blood. It wasn't enough for me to, to feel loved hmm. and to, to be loved. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, what an affront to God. Uh, what a horrible thing to do to his truth. Um, but but in reality, that's the way I lived most of my yeah. life up until my, my early 30s. So what would you, because, you know, I like to, and I think, I think it was Jack Deere, but he said, I think it was Jack Deere who said, knowledge of the Bible, I might be shredding it, but knowledge of the Bible without the Spirit is devilish. And I'm thinking, you know, kind of that's the same vein, roughly. I hope I quoted that somewhat right. But you understand is would you what would you say to someone who is saying, I really am reading the Bible, I am memorizing scripture, but I just don't I'm just you know what I mean? Because like you know, I mean, wouldn't you say though, uh, Michael, is that I was a sincere Christian as a Baptist boy, but I didn't know what deliverance was. And I will say to you humbly, I don't know if you heard of Tom White, you ever heard of the deliverance guy, Tom White? He was back in old school. He had a book called uh, "Guide to." See. He was with us, um, with uh, Wimber and all those guys. But um, he delivered me. He was before he became. He had a best-selling book in the '80s, and it was called "Guide to Spiritual Warfare." But anyways, he prayed for me. Well, he broke off from the Baptist church, was kicked out, and so I'm seeing, I'm hearing demonic voices, seeing faces, and all of a sudden, my Baptist guy led me, to the Lord. He goes, "Why don't you just go see Tom?" And I'm going because that's only for freaky people you know and even though i'm hearing voices and stuff but he prayed for me but if i hadn't have been delivered i don't know where i'd be i mean i was i mean i'm in bible college right. and i'm literally i don't know if you're i hope you didn't watch it but is um what, what's the movie um the twilight and uh it's filmed right in my bible college it's um multnomah school about it but it was a sister school of it and it's right in kennedy beach oregon well that's where they filmed twilight so we're in there well i'm on this cliff where they filmed a lot of it and people were committing suicide right and left. So I go to it, and there's it's so funny. I had this fence, not funny, but they had a fence that's about two feet high that people could trip over and literally fall 200 feet to a jagged mm. rock thing. Well, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, and I'm loving God with all my heart, delivered from drugs radically, sexual morality, everything, but I'm still hearing voices. I'm still seeing demonic faces. And then mm-hmm. I'm sitting there, and this is when I knew this is bad. I'm on this cliff, mm-hmm. and I'm looking over the cliff, and I'm not in a bad mood. I'm in Bible college, so I'm studying the Word every day, and all of a sudden I hear this voice, jump, as if it would be like a fun thing to jump off a 200-foot cliff into a rock. And I'm like, what is going on? And then Mm -hmm. I felt this light push on my back, and it freaked me out so much. I flew back into the bushes, and my girlfriend at the time, she goes, what are you doing, you freak? And I go, and so I told her. I didn't care anymore. I was like, this is ridiculous. And then, But that was two and a half years in my Christianity that I thought that was normal. You know what I mean? And it wasn't until this guy, Tom, who was this considered heretic because he was believing you could be demonized as a Christian, and he prays for me. How and, is that heresy? Yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> but you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, now you can't say, you know, that you believe in the sovereignty of God, right? But I mean, I'm thinking, what if that guy wasn't in my life? It's funny, Little Corvallis, Oregon, I was at, and that yeah. God raised this guy up in my church, and now he's this national figure, or he was in the 80s. But I'm thinking, what if I hadn't met him? What if I hadn't met him? What would have been my outcome? Now you say, well, God would work that, and He did. Mm-hmm. But it scares me of how 
few churches, especially Calvary's, really walk in balanced deliverance mm-hmm. because they're just saying, yeah. read your Bible, do more, and putting, if you think about it, if you're in a church that says there's no such thing as oppression, Hard. what's it going to do to someone like me? I think, good God, thankful I know it wasn't in Calvary in the early days because I would have been just try harder. Yeah. Yeah. My The real uh, tragic part of this, and I, I've seen this happen even recently within the year. So because of the remnant radio and the number of uh, times we've taught on uh, deliverance and, and expelling and expulsing evil spirits, um, I get a lot of people showing up to my church who don't go to my church, mm-hmm. people requesting and things like that. I had one lady show up to a service. She she came in from two states over, mm-hmm. and she was there to get um, prayer from me. And I didn't I didn't know her, never met her. She didn't tell me about it beforehand, didn't request. She just showed up and said, "Would you please pray for me?" Um, she says, "I'm I'm almost certain that that I've got an evil spirit that's uh, afflicting me." Um, I, I asked the pastors of my church to pray for me. Uh, they said, we don't believe Christians can be demonized. Mm-hmm. So she's like, well, I, I am a Christian. They say, well, either you're a Christian and you're just psychologically mm-hmm. ill or you're not a Christian and you really do have a demon. But in either case, we don't, we don't think we're equipped to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but they have her questioning her salvation yeah. because of this, um, and so she comes to me and I, and I starts getting my opinion. I said, well, I, I personally think you're, you know, based on what you've told me, you've given me the confession of faith. Uh, you obviously hate this evil that's in your life. You want to be free from it. Uh, you, you seem like a believer to me. Um, and I think you may be demonized. And so let's deal with that. And so my wife and I prayed for her maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And sure enough, she was, she was demonized mm-hmm. and we got rid of some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was dramatically set free. Mm-hmm. And I've had a number of people like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's a tragedy that churches would turn demonized people, their own members, members of their mm-hmm. own yeah. churches away because uh, they don't know what to do. Um, now, I get that. Like, there are some marital problems. I'm not, a, I, I'm not uh, so informed on how to, how to fix marriages that I'm going to try to take that on. Like, I actually outsource some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there are people far more equipped than me. But when it comes to casting out demons, that's actually something we're supposed to yeah, do. Exactly. That was pretty normal. Yeah. Um, and so that that's kind of a travesty today that the Western Church, by and large, doesn't know how to do this and probably doesn't know how to identify demonic spirit when it's there. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's so. so neat to encourage. I don't know if it's encourage you. I think you need it. But is I after the conference because you know we're kind of Calvary in, in our area in Tucson is pretty Baptocostal as Calvary's. We have three Calvary's. But it's like, so I'm kind of the crazy Calvary trying to go old school. And uh, But it was so neat seeing you guys just kind of encourage me. And just like when you give words, I mean, no, mm-hmm. not trying to dog you, but you know, you'd miss it. Sometimes you go, well, I missed it. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that really, because I'm such a perfectionist. Like, yeah. I don't have it exactly right. I don't want to mess up and oh, do it. Right. And so I kind of paralyzed myself with perfectionism, right? But after I saw you, you know, mess up a ton. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. No. But I'm just saying, no, I I'm I kidding. Did. I'm yeah. kidding, bro. And you know, it's funny. Joshua loves you so much. He goes, he usually is way, way better. Than, you know, getting the first night or something. You know, but anyway, so, but it really encouraged me. I mean, that was all I'm sincere. I'm dogging you. But, it means, sure. but it's like, and then yeah. I said, okay, God, I'm open to whatever you want to do. And ever since we've been back, we've been deal. We've like probably done a deliverance every Sunday, yeah. and just because I said you. okay, I just I went, and not that I hadn't done deliverance before, but I just kind of slowed it up because you know. And this is what I asked you. Here's one it. thing I will say to you. I remember, I said, if what if you do deliverance? Because you said give an hour and then have them come back. Well, we always said this girl goes, I'm I'm having presences in my room. I feel the you know night terror pressure. Oh so then I said, I just kind of discerned. I said, have you done any terror? You know, anything, I said Ouija, said board. Ouija board. I said any Ouija board, and she goes, no, no, no. And she goes, oh, my goodness. And then she just, and then it was, oh, my goodness, to nothing, like to like 12 major, like the pendulum thing of should you eat this oh, food, yeah. the sweet grass. I'm going, okay, that was a lot of nothing, you know. And then she confessed, renounced it, and boom. And But then she was sort of like, because she couldn't breathe. As soon as we prayed, I said, well, let's just see. Started, like, and now she goes, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And then, you know, and I love what Calvary guys say. It's the power of suggestion. I didn't say, as I pray for you, you might not be able to breathe. You might, like, you might feel this like heaviness on you. And so then we prayed. But anyway, 
But this is where I was saying, you know, I asked you because I've done this a few times. But she goes, she felt counselor's remorse, like, oh, I can't believe how much I freaked out, you know, manifested kind of the, mm-hmm. you know, freaky and the heaviness. And she, oh, she started, she started doing the, you know, the throw up thing, like, Ugh! and I said, stop. Because I don't know if you remember, like, Wimber. I don't know if, if Dak Deer ever told you this, but me and my pastor, we went to the conference for Wimber. This is back in like 87. And all, and his, when he had the one in the, in the circle, or sorry, the Kmart, he had puke stains all over the front of the altar. And I'm like, oh, and he goes, and he had buckets with plastic. And John, my pastor goes, you don't have to do that. You can tell him to stop. And I'm going, but I go, golly, I would, cause as a system pastor, I didn't want to have to be puke, you know, cleaning up puke stains. But anyways, so I'm saying that is that she then had remorse, counselor's remorse, kind of saying, we I'm a little embarrassed. But we said, hey, we we've all been freaks. Just, you know, come on, don't be embarrassed. But she almost was tempted to pull back, so even though she was touched. But it was, so, I don't know if you know this is, if you know this, Michael, but yeah. they have so many layers now with all the new age stuff yeah. that it's not a simple, like you said, we love the boom in the name of Jesus, they're totally delivered. But it's like they've got so many layers of welcoming the enemy, strongholds, where it's not a one time prayer. I mean, sometimes it's going to take two or three times, like you said, especially if you do an hour. And, you know, after I'm, you know, got two services, I can't spend you know, between services and even after, but it was just crazy to me yeah. how I want to say to you to encourage you, yeah. but just seeing you moving in that yeah. really, and why I went, I'm not a Calvinist, you know, Calvary tried to be the in-between, but it was just neat to see what I loved is you're so solid in the word, Amen. but yet you also believe in the gifts done decently in order. And that's really cool. But it just kind of liberated me to say, you know what? If a Calvinist can do this, how much more? No, okay. But I'm just saying, I should be able to do this. And it just gave us liberty, and we're mm-hmm. kind of going back. So I don't know if that encourages you or not, but I'm saying yeah. thank you, bro. Well, I, you might be surprised. I'm probably not as much of a Calvinist as you thought, okay. first off. Okay. <laughs> I, I hang out with all the Calvinists. So <laughs> it's probably because I can relate to them the yeah. most. The actually nine guys that are embracing the gifts tend to be Little uh, the in. guys that I'm running around with. Yeah. Right. Um, I like that. No, I, I love that. I'm glad you guys are doing that. I, I just There's so many people that, that want help, don't know where to find it, don't even know what they're dealing with. And yet God has given us this crazy authority and power, mm-hmm. and we don't even know what we've got. Mm-hmm. We don't even know that we can help people. Um, something else I wanted to mention is I just don't want anybody to leave uh, thinking that, the, that what took place for me to get free of the abandonment and rejection happened overnight. Mm-hmm. Uh, it did. It was about six months to a year of of really learning to take the the negative beliefs captive yeah. and replace them with truth. Mm-hmm. But I didn't just like in the moment fight it off with truth. I was meditating on the truth that I needed regularly. Yeah. Can you can and you so, unpack that, Michael? Because uh, I really liked how you said you would try to identify the lie, right? The devil's been telling you for thirty years, and 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 get yeah. a truth that would kind of fill that hole, right? Kind of plug up that inroad right. of the devil. So I, I created a, a journal called the Overcomers yeah. Journal that sort of maps out the process and, and helps with prompting questions to help you get to the bottom of things. And so uh, what I would do is at the end of the day, I would ask myself the question, what negative emotions did I feel today? Mm-hmm. And for most men, we're quite unaware mm-hmm. of what those mm-hmm. are. Um, but for me, I, I boiled it down to just a few basic ones. Uh, shame, which is guilt over who we are. It's an identity issue. Uh Uh, or shame is sadness over who we think we are. Guilt is sadness over something we've done. And then there's fear and anxiety, which is usually pretty Mm self-explanatory. And then anger as well. But that that tends to be, uh, anger is the the energy that is given to us to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's usually because there's something underneath it, which is shame, guilt, and fear. So yeah, for me, anger is, I realize, you know, in the last probably 10 years, when I get angry, it's really because it's how I, because I felt so powerless as a kid that I got kind of to be a fighter, got big and strong. So then I just dealt my fear with kind of fight, you know, just you attack hate pain. It. Right. Like, I mean, like you always say, you don't like yeah. the fact that. Yeah. My, my I hate weakness. Mom, I realize that because I got COVID real bad. Oh. I was in the hospital and I hated feeling oh, so sure. weak, you know? Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. So most, this is the, the, probably one of the main reasons why so many people struggle with addictions of various mm-hmm. kinds is that at the end of the day, there was some need that wasn't met in their childhood yeah. and they feel, and that, that need gets re-triggered through pain and they try to meet that uh, with unhealthy ways. And so I would ask myself at the end of the day, what negative emotion was I feeling? What was I thinking about when I was feeling that feeling? Mm-hmm. 
Now that that thought process, like let's let's take the example of my girlfriend not texting me back. Um, you know, she didn't text me back. It's been five minutes. Here's I'm feeling f- afraid, uh, anxious, sad. Uh, what I was thinking about was the fact that she didn't text me back. Oh, you know what? It's because uh, yeah, she. I thought to myself, hey, not only she didn't text me back, she probably doesn't want to be with me anymore. Mm-hmm. And this is where you can ask the next question: Is what does that say about me? Mm-hmm. What is it that I believe about myself because she hasn't texted me back and she doesn't want to be with me? Mm-hmm. Um, well, what I believe is that I'm not really worth knowing and loving. And you would you say and, the start was because dad left you as a one year old? Yeah, that, and then that's the child's that's the trauma, start of it. Trauma, but, yeah. Right, that's the, the start of it. But at the end of the day, that was reinforced over a number yeah, of years. Really yeah. And you know, and so right, Deliverance all. Satan builds that case, right? Because he knows I got kind of a good start. Now I'll just keep building that through 30 years, right? Right, right. And I, I just don't think you can take away a thought pattern overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the Lord may do a sovereign work yeah. and suddenly change the strength of a particular thought. Because the fact is, thoughts that you've been thinking for a prolonged period of time, it's like a muscle that you've worked mm-hmm. out over and over and over. And you need it to atrophy. It's so strong that it comes on you like a tsunami of emotion. And then once it atrophies, it becomes more of a wave of emotion. Or maybe you just feel it like a fly. Um, that's the degradation of a particular thought pattern and the emotions that come from that thought pattern. And so in the morning, I would meditate on the truth I needed to overcome that negative belief. So real repentance for, for my thought life looked like I've been believing this thing over here. Uh, I've got to repent, turn from those wicked thoughts, mm-hmm. take them captive. And then turn towards truth, Mm -hmm. which is uh, I I commit myself to the thought and belief that God loves Mm -hmm. me just the way I am, that I'm worth knowing and loving because Jesus Christ died for my sins. And so uh, six months of that, and and it was a reprogramming of my brain. It was, uh, which is, you know, biblical, right? Uh, Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed. And then he tells you how through the renewal of your mind. And so that's kind of the, the process. And you said, didn't I think I heard you say humbly, not that you never get attacked now, mm, yeah. but those attacks are a lot more manageable yep. and you can quickly see it. Ah, here's what's, exactly. I see what the devil, right? You kind of, you can head it off at the past right. quicker. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and I have the tools to deal with it. Let's say I can't quite deal with it in the moment. Uh, usually I'll just ride whatever emotion that is and just let it wear out. I don't act out of it. Um, knowing that I can deal with it later, the emotion will eventually dissipate because all the emotions do, they don't last forever. Um, and then I've got a number of friends that I can call and say, Hey, I was feeling this earlier. Can you help me discover what I was thinking about and what that says about me or about God or about the world around me? And what is the truth that I need to overcome that? Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I'm going to mention this again, just in case people haven't heard of it, but the, the overcomers yeah. journal, you can find that, um, on a website, thomasministries.org. I've got a link there. And then I've also, we've got a website for the overcomers journal.com. Yeah. Um, and that, but, and but that they, just asks all those questions every day to journal it. Right. It's just a, it's just a prompter. Yeah. I, I think it's best if you're really dealing with a, a very real stronghold of the mind, I would commit myself to a six month process mm-hmm. of journaling and meditation. Uh, and, and then I would also have a few people that are on call that you can help that, that, that are familiar with the process and can help to prompt you with the right questions. Yeah. I say the thing is, I just don't think you can do it by yourself. Yeah. Um, everybody actually needs real friendships who, who are committed to helping us grow as individuals, become more Christ-like, which is at the end of the day, what we're really talking mm-hmm. about. Amen. Amen. Which is real discipleship too. I mean, yeah. We don't have yes. a lot of discipleship mm-hmm. going. Right. And I think it's because a lot of us are so dysfunctional. We can't say like the First Corinthians 11, follow my examples, I follow examples. Very few of us can really yeah. say, hey, I'm not perfect, but I am more like Christ today than I was yesterday, right? That's and, what you always and, joke about the yeah. Google dolls. Like, um, we don't want, like, we don't want the world to know us. Like, we get don't afraid understand. because we're like, oh, no, if they really get to know me, they won't like me. But it's like, we need to stop fearing man and, like, I think you had mentioned it too, but like James five sixteen, confess your sins to one another so you might be healed. Like sometimes we really do need to just say it and then realize that other people have things. Not that you need to relate to everyone, but it really does help us know that, hey, we're not alone yeah, exactly. in this. But yeah, like, well, like there... what one pastor said, he goes, if you knew the sin in my life, you yeah. wouldn't listen to me. But if I knew the sin in your life, I wouldn't talk to you. So yeah. let's just be humble. We all have issues that we need to Amen. be humble about. Amen. You know I mean? Yeah, that's a good way to think of it. Amen. 
But do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? I know you kind of already said one, but we're going to have all your, and then you can also share the listeners where they can find you. You said thomasministries.org, but we'll put the Overcomer Journal and everything in the description below. But sure. anything else for our listeners? I'm praying for uh, n- n- no, uh, I just, I'm, I'm just thankful for the opportunity. I, I really believe that this process is helpful mm-hmm. for, for people. And so uh, I say this because this was my life. Like yeah. I, I, I wanted to die. I, I hated my life myself that much. I hated myself that much. Yeah. And now today I, I love myself quite honestly and sincerely in a, in a healthy, and I mean that in a healthy way. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the life I have. I'm married happily, got two kids. I'm not worried about my wife leaving me or wanting to check out. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if she did, I know that life would still be good and that I'd be okay. Yeah, because so. yeah, I'm, I'm going through that with my wife having cancer to thinking, you know, yes. can I still say God is good even if the Lord chooses? Like remember Ch- right. Chandler, I, I quoted that, stole it from him. God can heal, God will heal, but even if he doesn't, you know, we're still going to believe. And will I still say God is good, even though I go, really, God, yes. this is what I need in ministry? I need I, I, what's uh, how I do it. But it's like you said, I don't need my wife. I want my wife. I want her to be healed. Of course, I'll praise God if he heals her. Mm-hmm. But will I praise God even if he decides to heal her in heaven? Will I still say God is good, he's faithful, and I trust him that I can make it with God. I don't have to have my wife to be able to, to do ministry, even though it will be hard. But it's like, you yeah. know, I mean, that God is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient. And as a, anyway, hey, I want to see this. Can we get this committee online? We want to have you and Joshua come and fix our church, show us how to do it right. <laughs> no, okay. Show us yeah, how to do deliverance. <laughs> we want to do like kind of more because Joshua came and spoke on prophetic, but it was more sure, of kind of clinical. Is. But we really would like you to give like, you know, to do the words to, to really and then maybe do some talk about deliver, talk about strongholds. Cause I really think, as you probably know better than me, but. The church is just riddled with strongholds. I mean, people sure. know Jesus, but they don't really, like you said, gnoskos and know, no, he really loves, loves me. Because I, I, I was saying that, I think I forget, it's John 17, where Jesus said mm-hmm. that the Father loves you as much as he loves me. Yeah. If people really believe that, I mean, we know, of course, the Father loves the Son. He's perfect. But mm-hmm. he loves me as much as he loves the Son. If we believe that, right. that would really, right, perfect love casts out fear. It would change us. But I don't always believe that. Like I heard someone say, Satan's job is to misinterpret the, the facts, to say, let me tell you what it really means, what happened here. And that's mm-hmm. where, so if you're willing to do that, I'd love to have you come down sometime, maybe you and Joshua, mm-hmm. to really uh, Joshua do like said a, okay. Joshua really said mean. okay, and he committed you to it. So uh, I guess oh, he did. Okay. <laughs> no. Just no. So, so if you're ever free, I know well, you got a new church, to... so you're pretty busy, right? Yeah. You traveled around. Uh, well, fortunately, we do our, our meetings on Tuesday nights, right. and that uh, affords me the freedom to do weekends away. Um, but just send me out some some different dates, and we'll see if we can make it work. Uh, I know that right now my my uh, season is ending. I'm not doing anything in December and January. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking it easy. Uh, but then come you know February, we have a conference out in Oklahoma, and then I've got a number of other ones that are sort of interspersed in the spring. So you just have to see if we can do something in there. Is that with Sam Storms or now it's uh, Michael, 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 uh, what's Michael's? Uh, is that the new, is that the, is that the new church? Yeah, it, well, it, it, it'll be hosted at Bridgeway, okay. but it's actually being put on by Brian Blount oh. from the Vineyard Church in uh, Oklahoma oh, really? City. Cool. And yeah, that, that's like the, I think the first weekend in February, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that'll be an interesting group. It's, uh, you know, Sam Storms and Jack Deer and then the guys from the Remnant. Uh, but then it's a, a bunch of other guys that we don't normally do stuff with, and I'm I'm excited to get to know them. Yeah. They're probably a bit more on the charismatic side yeah. of the spectrum, but I think they also see the need for some uh, reform within. Can I get the, you in trouble here, prophetic Michael? movement? Because I was just sure. amazed at how, like, we had you know we had uh, not Jack Deere, but we had uh, Sam Storms, but how it's so weird how like or you Michael know like Brown. remember when Matthew or not Matthew when uh, who's Matt Chandler said. Hey, but you know, a lot of people think of Bethel and all this stuff, and then you go, "Hey, these are our brothers." And I'm like, kind of going because I've you know, I've interviewed a lot of these people and talked to like Randy Clark, and you know, and I asked Randy, and I was telling this to to Sam Storms. I said, Randy, just like five years ago when I interviewed him, he, not on the podcast, but in real life, and he said, eighty five percent of what happens in my meetings is flesh. Now he's been doing this for twenty five years now i mean the toronto blessing i'm going bro wouldn't you like those stats a little reversed like maybe you know what i mean because you know wherever the spirit is there could be but but i'm going 85 percent is flat that's his own words 
And Sam's like, well, bro. And he goes, you're my friend. And I'm just going, call me a perfectionist, but I'm going, I'm thinking at 25 years, we should be a little, you know, but anyway, so I don't know if you want to, you probably don't want to go well, there. But I, I'm just I saying is- he, he probably tolerates a lot more than others of us would. Yeah, <laughs> because because my thing is, and this is where I'd love to have someone like you come, because I went from Baptist to mm-hmm. to a kind of the early- how do you say it? Chuck Smith with Calvary said the church I was at in Tucson here was the second Calvary chapel. So it didn't spread out. It happened simultaneously. So it was a beautiful move, hippie movement, innocent, just pure, decently in order. And then the Toronto came and then it went buck wild. And I mean, I'm just like, so I'm the dog oh, yeah. catcher and I'm hearing people barking and they're, I'm saying, bro, you're out of order. And they're saying, you're quenching the spirit. So then it made me just go, I'm, I'm going to go Baptist again. Right. So now I'm kind of like a Baptist, Baptocostal where I'm trying to find balance and more little liberty, but I'm a little like, you know, and I, 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 who, who do we have? Who do we have though? We had Michael, was it Michael, Michael Brown. Brown? He rebuked me because I said, I I'm a charismatic with C-Bone. He goes, you're just about as extreme people. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, but I want to find a balance. So that's why I yeah. like you yeah. more, you're more uh, kind of uh, really hard, you know, solid word people who are, you know, that want the true move of the spirit, but with biblical grounds, you know, well, they're just not going to yeah. go wild. Most guys who say they're charismatic with the seatbelt on are really just practical cessationists mm-hmm. who are pumping the brakes on the yeah, car. Yeah, that's not what <laughs> we're doing. We're doing it because I saw, you know, hey. like, here's my example. So this guy's barking like a dog, Michael, and then he lifts his leg to pee on a speaker. He's, you know, he's not literally, but he's lifting like he's a dog. So I say, brother, I said, bro, you're out of order. And he goes, you're quenching the spirit, man. And I go, it's a spirit, <laughs> but it's not the Holy Spirit. And then I just go, I can't take this anymore. You know what I mean? It just got to be, here I went from me yeah. and Mr. Moving the prophetic to now I'm a quench a spirit quencher and i'm like going so then i kind of went back to my baptist roots you know i went to a baptist church and now i said I okay that, you know what i mean so i'm so i'm i need healing so if you could pray for deliverance for me <laughs> no. yes i i don't think that's quenching the spirit i think the guy was out of order and out of turn uh and but but i'm sad that you kind of threw the baby out with the yeah. bath water for a season i'm glad you You've picked it well, back Well, I still up, believe so. that I just didn't practice it. You know, I just kind of was a closet charismatic cousin. Sure. Amen. Well, can you All pray right. for pray us, bro? Pray for us because he's got to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for, for what they're doing there in uh, Arizona. I ask you bless the ministry and the work of their hands. And would you cause people who are oppressed and, and in need of freedom uh, to find it in the ministry there? And uh, would you also raise up other pastors in the area to do those very things? Um, and when, when we talk about Calvary uh, or Vineyard or any of these other denominations, uh, I ask, Lord, that all of them would be doing the works of Jesus, uh, that you would make those works available for everybody and bring them into an awareness of it for the sake of those who are oppressed and in need of freedom. Uh, let your kingdom come. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, bro. Thank you, Thanks for all your time, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you'd like to listen to us, wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram to check out our behind the scenes at Calvary Conversations. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please make sure to check out their website in the description below. We would like for you guys to just prayerfully consider supporting Calvary Conversations. You guys can do that in the description below. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly gift so that we can get many more amazing podcast guests here in person at Calvary Valley Church. We've had Stephen Bancars, Charlie Kirk, Seth Gruber, Joshua Lewis, Brian Sumner, and we would like to have Michael Miller come too. So if you guys would like to do that, pray about it. And we again are so thankful for all you guys and your support. And please make sure to share this video with your friends and family. Thanks so much, guys. And we'll see you next week.